It is my great pleasure to call on Honorable Mike Monroney, our senior United States Senator from Oklahoma. Senator Monroney. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Shirk, for an opportunity to participate here in this day when we honor the man who brought uh, the achievements in space uh, for America uh, back into uh, first place for us. It's suitable, I think, as we honor the uh, two latest voyagers in space and their very successful conquest, uh, Colonel Tom Stafford and Commander Gene Cernan, for their spectacular achievements in space that we commemorate by placing a uh, time capsule uh, to commemorate another early day pioneer, uh, the great Wiley Post, who did so much in the early days of aviation to advance the science of aeronautics and astronautics. A Wiley, who I had the pleasure of covering as a young cub reporter on his many barnstorming tours and on his stunt pilot exhibitions, occupies a distinguished place in world aviation history. Post, of course, is best known for his round-the-world flights in the Lockheed Vega, the Winnie Mae, which was owned by F.C. Hall of Chickasha, and which set the world's records in 1931 and 1933 uh, for uh, transiting the globe in uh, uh, record-breaking time. It's interesting to note that the first flight was made with the crude navigation instruments that we had of those times, but with a navigator, but that Wiley Post had to navigate completely on his own on the solo flight in 1933. Uh, on both of these flights, Wiley Post had to flight plan the entire operation, had to arrange for the necessary supplies, including the special high-test gasoline that was unavailable uh, generally throughout the parts of the world at which he sought to travel. The first record flight in 1931 took him eight days, 15 hours, and 51 minutes, and was only broken by his own spectacular solo flight two years later of seven days, 18 hours, and 49 minutes. There were many times as you read the history of this great flight where because of weather or because of miscalculation and navigation, uh, off course and other things, Wiley was sorely tempted to bail out and give up the trip. But the courage and the feeling that this could be done and had to be done was one of the things that brought him through. Earlier than these record-breaking round-the-world cruises was his uh, exploit of uh, winning uh, the earliest triumph with the then brand new Winnie Mae in the 1930 Bendix Air Derby. And unknown, he entered the race with this new plane and managed the 1,760-mile race course from Los Angeles to Chicago to come in first. And with this great prominence that it gave to him, uh, Post uh, advanced on to the round the world flights which brought fame and uh, recognition uh, to this Oklahoma pilot and to Oklahoma aviation. Post had the same unlimited vision that has enabled our own astronauts that we honor here today to open new areas in outer space. His predictions after his solo round the world flight held true now, some 33 years later, he foresaw the dramatic increase in the size, the reliability, the speed, and the high altitude performance of the airplane of the future, and 33 years ago predicted the future of the jet planes that we enjoy today. He predicted that an all-metal cabin uh, would be pressurized, that we would have the ability to whip the adverse weather with a hot wing plane that could melt the snow and the ice, and conquer and cure this hazard of aviation. He judged that we would fly at some 800 miles an hour speed and at altitudes of around 45,000 feet. Today, of course, we've reached the 600 miles an hour speed at 40,000 feet altitude or commonplace thoroughfares of the air as our jets transit the world's airways. And pending in Congress today, legislation that will step up the capability of supersonic flight, which will not only reach the 800 miles that he predicted, but will probably reach the 1,800 miles an hour, but it's going to be possible if we are able to bring about the development of a Mach 3 aircraft to bring uh, the progress of aviation to its full flower. His vast experience in his round-the-world flying convinced him that high-altitude flying was bound to come, and he decided to devote his major time from then on 
to the study of the substratosphere and the conditions required to fly in the rarefied atmosphere and in the frigid weather that would be found at these high altitudes. As a good practical gadgeteer, Wiley Post knew it would have then been impossible to pressurize the Winnie Mae, or any airplane for that matter, but he felt that he could provide a handmade flight suit that could stand up at high elevation and protect the pilot from the rarefied air and from the extreme cold that was there. He patterned it after a diver suit and had Goodyear Tire Rubber Company fabricate it from rubberized fabric. The headgear also resembled in many respects a diver's helmet with an opening glass in the front at which he could open and look out when necessary and was made to supply the necessary oxygen enriched air at the high altitude. A second tube wound around the engine and before going into the substratosphere, the suit could be turned on to bring the heat from the engine to keep the pilot warm at 50,000 up to 70,000 feet. The Winnie Mae was modified to use a special high test gasoline to prevent the bleed off of the fuel and his Pratt & Whitney engine was supercharged. He sought to beat the then existing altitude record of 47,000 feet and tested his revolutionary new stratospheric suit over Chicago in 1934. This handmade uh, do-it-yourself kit almost at 40,000 feet didn't work any better than some of the space hardware did on the, on the first early test that our astronauts had to go through, excepting it didn't break in as many places, uh, his broke in more places. At 40,000 feet on this first test, the tubes became pinched, the oxygen shut off, and he had to descend. But he had seen enough in that flight to believe that the planes would reach the high speeds and the higher altitudes, and these would be the new avenues of the air. His next test was at Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and he got to 32,700 feet, and an automatic release valve stuck in the suit. He operated the valve by hand and continued to climb out to 51,000 feet for what apparently was a world record. But somewhere or other, it couldn't be verified because of a faulty altimeter, and uh, <coughs> the Bureau of Standards was never able to certify this but most of the aviation fraternity of that day felt that he had reached the 51,000 feet for a new record. Four days later, he tried again, and his altimeter froze at 40,000 feet. He continued to climb and reached the altitude thought to have been 55,000 feet, but again, this could not be verified because of the frozen altimeter. Still convinced that planes could set new high-performance marks at flying over 30,000 feet, Post boosted the, Post boosted the Winnie Mays performance, by altitude flying from 150 miles an hour to 340 miles per hour, an unheard of speed for that day and that type of plane. In 1935, he devoted his time to try to set in the substratosphere new avenues across the continent. His first flight again was forced down by faulty material, largely the flight suit and the leaky helmet. On his second flight, he flew from Los Angeles to Cleveland to set a new record of seven hours and 19 minutes. He had proven his case that man could navigate the substratosphere and the performance of aircraft would reach new high speeds in that rarefied air. His failures with new equipment, pressurized and heated flight suits, oxygen generators and heaters were many, but he did much to explore the unknown of his day as our distinguished guests here today have done in this universe of outer space. And their difficulties and equipment failures which have caused postponements, I think, in record number to our distinguished uh, <coughs> Oklahoman, <coughs> uh, Colonel Stafford, uh, were always too experienced by these other pioneers of the earlier day. But the gains for mankind and their efforts, and these men's continuing progress to new goals, expands the knowledge to all mankind. And even the tragic consequences of the tragedy of Wiley Post's death at Point Barrow with the great Will Rogers, Another Oklahoman of uncomparability uh, as a statesman, as a writer, as a humorist, and as a philosopher. These two men were making an effort to blaze a new air route to the Far East. It is remarkable when you follow Wiley Post's planned flight over Alaska, how closely similar his set course was, how closely it rem uh, resembles our present polar route via Anchorage, Alaska, over the Aleutians to Tokyo, Japan. And thus the breakthroughs of science resulting from our new explorations of space by our astronauts too will add much to the value and human knowledge for the conquest of outer space of things unknown and to bring about 
this additional knowledge for the benefit of all mankind. I thank you very much, Mayor. Senator Monroney worked with James Webb to make the appearance of Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan possible. Senator Monroney. Thank you very much, Chairman Young, for the introduction, for the opportunity of being here. Governor Winters, Mayor Shirk, Chairman McGee, and distinguished officers and members of the Frontiers of Science, members of the Chamber of Commerce and our distinguished guests from Weatherford. I'm happy to be on a program today that I think will be remembered through the years as being one of the outstanding scientific programs ever given in Oklahoma. We appreciate so much Dr. Beaker's marvelous address. We appreciate being honored here today by having the opportunity to be hosts to two of our most distinguished Americans. They're here today to allow us to express our appreciation to them in person. Yes, and to their wives who waited through that long three days for their great help in establishing American supremacy in outer space. We in Oklahoma are honored because these two men who have risked so much to give the United States this preeminence are not only men of tremendous courage, skill, and technical ability, but have proven their great interest in the field of education and training in the aeronautical and astronautical sciences as well. We're proud indeed of both of them, especially proud of our own fellow Oklahoman, Colonel Stafford, who was born in Weatherford, Oklahoma on September 17, 1930, went through the Oklahoma public school systems and was chosen to represent the Western District of Oklahoma in the great U.S. Uh, Naval Academy uh, and uh, was commissioned on graduation of all things in the United States Air Force. And believe me, you have to be pretty darn good uh, to come out of the Naval Academy and get into the United States Air Force. <laughs> he was educated in the higher skills of fighter interceptor aircraft and later in the United States Air Force Experimental Flight Test School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. He served as chief of the performance branch of the United States Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards. And here he's responsible for the supervision and administration of the flying curriculum for student test pilots. Not only mastered the science, but as they say, when they want to be real complimentary, he wrote the book all about it. And he is the establishment, he established the textbooks and is co-author of the pilot's handbooks for performance flight testing and for aerodynamic handbook for performance flight testing. After 4,700 hours of flight time, 3,800 of these hours in jets, he was chosen by NASA to be one of the nine astronauts in September 1962. At that time, of all things, he was not a test pilot working at Edwards Air Force Base, but to show his versatility, he was attending as an honor student from the services, the Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration. Colonel Stafford was pilot in the backup crew on the first manned Gemini flight. On December 15th and 16th in 1965, he was pilot of the history-making GT-6 flight, which established another first in space by performing the first rendezvous of two manned maneuverable spacecraft with the orbiting GT-7. With his distinguished pilot, who we are happy to have here today, Pilot Cernan, he was companion pilot of the Gemini 9 and the most spectacular space exploits yet achieved, which began on June 3rd, 1966 and remained in orbit for approximately three days. This exhibition thrilled the entire world and particularly those in America who followed it throughout the entire period. The degree of excellence in education and educational pursuits followed Commander Cernan as it did Colonel Stafford. He took his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University, and his Master of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the United States Naval Postgraduate School. His educational attainments won him membership in Tau Beta Phi, National Engineering Society, and in Sigma Xi, the National Science Research Society. 
May I add that I'm glad to note he's also a member of Phi Gamma Delta Social Fraternity. He is one of the outstanding graduates uh, of our college reserve officer system, having received his commission through the Naval ROTC program at Purdue and entered flight training upon his graduation. Prior to attending the Navy postgraduate school, he was assigned to attack squadrons 126 and 113 at Miramar, California Naval Air Station, where he logged more than 1,800 hours of flying time and more than 1,600 of these were in jet aircraft. As a member of the third group of astronauts, he was selected by NASA in October 1963. He was part of the Gemini 9 mission, and it was during this spectacular flight that he spent a record time of two hours and 10 minutes on a spacewalk, multiplying by more than 10 to 15 times the amount of time ever spent in outer space uh, uh, outside of the capsule in which he had been carried there. But it certainly wasn't as simple as it sounds when you mentioned it today. This was an exploit that will be long remembered and developed so many, many important leads in our space navigation that I think he can claim to have established an outstanding record that will lead us forward to many, many breakthroughs. And so I am privileged indeed to present two men who have brought America to a preeminence in outer space by their courage and knowledge and by their reports on what they found. I'm happy to present Oklahoma's own Tom Stafford and his fellow astronaut, Gene Cernan. Thank you.